Welcome to Bits and Bytes. This episode is about how to use the computer to make pictures. Not just pictures for the artist, but pictures that can be useful for businessmen or scientists or teachers. We'll also look into the meaning of terms such as high and low resolution and find out what a pixel is and what the difference is between a TV set and a computer monitor. We'll start by looking at the simplest possible way of putting a picture on a computer screen. But I've already done some computer graphics in a sense, haven't I? When I used logo in an earlier episode to draw a square and make it rotate. Yes, but let's go back to fundamentals now. Start at a really elementary level. For example, some of the microcomputers already have pictures on their keys. Look at the pet keyboard. It has a lot of extra graphic symbols. Now hold the shift key down to type them. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's pretty easy, but with all these symbols, I could draw all sorts of things. Faces, uh, rocket ships, anything you name. And this is exactly how all the graphics for programs in the pet are produced, by designing a picture with these symbols and then incorporating that picture into a program. But the apple, it doesn't seem to have any of these extra symbols. No, many computers don't. In fact, among the most popular ones, only the Commodore machines have special graphic symbols. But how do I make pictures on the Apple, for instance? Well, most of the micros have certain commands as part of their basic programming language to help you to produce pictures. I'll show you. Type a program line number on the Apple. All right. And now GR to tell the computer that you're going into the graphics mode. And return. Return. Second line, 20. Color equals. Equals what? Well, right now you have a choice of 16 different colors. They're numbered from 0 to 15. If you type 13, you get yellow. I don't have anything yet. Well, wait a minute. The next step is to tell the computer where on the screen you want something to come up in yellow. And to explain how this works, we've prepared a transparency. Oh, yes, here we are. Oh, it has a grid on it. And this shows how the computer screen is divided up into 40 squares across and 40 squares down. Each square has an address that tells how many squares over and how many squares down it is. So if you want to color in 20, 15 with a crayon, you find that square by going 20 squares over and 15 squares down. Okay. I get it. It would be like saying, if you're going to meet someone in New York City, I'll meet you at 54th Street and 3rd Avenue. Only in this case, it would be 20th Street and 15th Avenue. You're right. It's exactly the same principle. So now you can type the next line. The word for place a square on the screen in basic is plot. So type plot 20, 15. Plot 20, 15. And run the program. Okay. And run. And now we lift up the transparency. And there's our spot in just the right place. Hi. Right. You can also draw lines on the screen. Start a new program and you'll see. Okay. Well, I won't need this anymore. So we type new, first line 10, gr, return, and 20, color equals, and now 30. If you want a vertical line, type vlin. If you want a horizontal line, type hlin. I think maybe a horizontal line. Okay, so H-L-I-N. Now, type the numbers that you want the line to begin and end at. Let's say I'd start over this side about three, comma. And let's say I'd go along to, uh, goes up to 40, let's say uh, 35. Now you must indicate how many squares down the screen you want the line to be. Oh, okay, well, let's say about oh, approximately midway. Um, 20. Type at 20, then return. At 20, return. Okay, now let's run it. 
Oh, okay. So six is blue. Well, that seems easy. And with just three graphics commands in basic, plot, place a square on the screen, H-line, draw a horizontal line, and V-line, draw a vertical line. You can obviously make up any sort of picture you like out of colored squares. All the squares are kind of big. I mean, how would I get a dot to appear or, say, a, a thin line? You can't. At least not as long as you stay in that graphics mode, because those are low-resolution graphics that you've been dealing with so far. And what's the difference between low-resolution and high-resolution graphics? How does all this work? Let's see. Old-fashioned movie theaters used to have display boards made up of hundreds of electric light bulbs, which could be turned on or off in various patterns to form words or pictures. This is exactly how your computer screen works. If you want to see your name in lights, all you have to do is type it. Because when you type something at the computer, what you're doing in effect is turning on a lot of little points of light on the screen. Each of these points of light is called a picture element, or pixel for short. There is a grid of about 250 by 200 pixels on the average computer screen giving you 50,000 pixels altogether. Now, there are two different methods by which the computer can transform what you type into corresponding patterns of pixels on the screen. The first method uses a chip inside the computer called a character generator, which automatically generates the equivalent of a V, for instance, in a little grid of pixels. With this method, you are limited to calling up chunks of pre-patterned pixels. You can't control the pixels individually. If you wanted to make a dot appear on the screen, for example, you couldn't instruct one pixel to appear, only a ready-made square consisting of a bunch of pixels. Because of this, any picture that you try to create out of these blocks will look chunky and rather primitive. This is why this first method of turning on parts of a computer screen is called low resolution. Contrast this with the second method of making computer pictures. With this method, you don't need a character generator. Instead, each binary digit or bit that goes into RAM memory can control an individual pixel on the screen. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between each bit and each pixel. Because these bits form a sort of map of which pixels will be on and which will be off on the screen, this is called bit mapping. Bit mapping allows you to make a single pixel appear, a little dot, or to make a thin line of single pixels, or to build up a fairly detailed picture. This method is therefore called high resolution. So when you don't have control of all the pixels, and have to go via a character generator, Valentino looks like this. But when you can do bit mapping, and therefore control each individual pixel, Valentino looks like this. So how can I do some high resolution graphics? You simply go into high resolution graphics mode. To go into low resolution graphics, you type GR. To go into high-resolution graphics, you type HGR. Okay. So, HGR. And color. Do I type H color? That's right. Only with the apple, what you gain on resolution, you lose on range of colors. In high-resolution mode, your choice of colors is narrowed down to eight, zero through seven. Okay, I'll try number one. H color. Color equals... One. Now, in high-resolution graphics, there are no horizontal or vertical line commands. You have to use the plot, or rather, hplot command to specify exactly which pixel you want to turn on. There's about 50,000 pixels on the screen, right? The Apple computer actually has 280 pixels across by 192 pixels down, but some of the screen is set aside for your instructions. So you normally only have 280 by 160 pixels for graphics. And we can demonstrate this by having you draw a frame around the screen. Just type this, hplot. Okay, hplot 
one comma one. One comma one. Two two seven nine. Seven nine comma one. Comma one. Two two seven nine comma one five nine. Two seven nine comma one five nine. Two one comma one five nine. One comma one five nine. Two one comma one. One comma one. Then return. And return. Oh, look at that. And this is only one pixel thick. Let me see now. It's one at one to 279 at one to 279 at 159 to one at 159 to one at one. But drawing a picture pixel by pixel must get pretty laborious. It does. That's why the graphics tablet was invented. Oh, I've always wanted to play with one of these. The tablet and the pen that goes with it are already plugged into the special circuit board that the Apple needs to run the tablet. Oh, I see. So I just plug the circuit board into the Apple. It goes into slot number five. Okay. Make sure it's off. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Now you have to tell the computer how to draw pictures with the graphics tablet. There's a ready-made program that does this that comes with the tablet. Oh, yes, that must be this here. Here we go. Graphics tablet software. Okay. <coughs> graphics tablet. Press ESC. Okay. Choose graphics tablet software. Press G and return. Okay. G, return. And now you can draw something or write something, whatever you like. All right, let's see. Oh, the cursor follows the movement of the pen. That's it. And as soon as you press down with the pen, you'll start drawing. Oh, this is much easier than plotting every pixel. Isn't it? The graphics tablet corresponds exactly to the screen. It's divided into the same number of pixels, 280 by 192. So I'm actually lighting up a trail of pixels as I move the pen. That's right. Now, how do I get rid of my picture? Do you see the row of squares at the top of the tablet? Ah, yes, here we are. Uh, clear. Abracadabra. Now, this is high-resolution graphics, so there are eight colors available on the Apple. If you want to see them, touch the pen color square. Oh, yes, here we are. Okay, uh, let's try orange. It's much easier than doing it by numbers, isn't it? You know, I find it very difficult, though, to draw a straight line. All right, clear the screen, then press the pen down in the line square. Now, all you have to do is make two dots to mark the ends of your line, and the computer will join the dots together. Oh, that's too easy. It can get even easier. Clear the screen. Can I do just one more? Okay, clear. Now, pen color white. Pen color. Okay, get the cursor over there and... Touch the square marked frame. Any two dots you make on the screen will form the diagonal corners of a rectangle. Look at that. It, you know, this would be great, especially for lazy artists. <laughs> if you want a solid box, just touch the square marked box and make two dots again. Wait a minute. No, I'll change the background color first. Let's see. Okay, let's try. That's a pretty blue. And we'll go orange. I'll make my box. Oh, that's beautiful. I'll make a couple of them. Look at that. If you'd like to save your work of art on the disc, simply touch the save square. That's amazing. So I could draw all sorts of pictures on this tablet and save them all on discs. Well, it's easy enough. You might call it the ultimate in doodling pads. But is it art?
I mean, could computer graphics be really useful to an artist? Well, certainly more and more artists are taking an interest in computer graphics nowadays, and teachers of art as well. Generally speaking, what we're after in this series of courses on teaching computers is introducing people to a medium that not only has the ability to draw a picture, but the ability to capture time and capture a process and reenact that process. Artists are communicators, and artists communicate with whatever medium is relevant for their time. With the invention of new painting techniques, new mathematical methods of creating three-dimensional imagery on two-dimensional planes, the Renaissance artists were able to express much more of a message in their time using the state of their art. Perception is generally what an artist brings to any technology that he or she is dealing with, and an understanding of perception is greatly needed in computers in general. To date, a lot of the software was written by technical people, and an artist who understands who is going to be sitting in front of the computer is going to be able to write a much more usable, a much more functional program, and at the same time help communicate through that program the fact that this isn't a machine that's trying to take over. This is simply something another person created to help you. As an educator, I find that when trying to teach concepts of something that exists in the, the world that we have here, it's very easy to convey quickly by modeling it on a computer. A straight line is simply a series of interconnected points. On a computer screen, you can point that out quite easily because the screen is digitized and broken into tiny points. Color theory and color mixing is quite easy to illustrate quickly with a computer because you are able to turn any dot on or off and have that dot be any one color. Everyone in this department is sharing a feeling of being on the verge of discovering something that no one has ever discovered. And that feeling can drive one on for a long time, both as a teacher and as an artist. They are dream machines. And there's also a place for computer graphics in business. The computer graphics industry is literally going through an explosion. The marketplace is growing quite rapidly, about 40% per year. People are now just beginning to really understand the benefit of business graphics. And they're now at the point in time where they're figuring out how can I best implement this kind of information presentation techniques to benefit my company in some cost-effective manner. This is the HP 2700 series of high-performance color graphics terminals. There are two different types of things you can do. The first is various types of business charts. What I'd like to do is to load in a bar chart, the data of which I've entered on the disk previously. Now, it has automatically scaled this to suit the size of the data. If I want more flexibility, for instance, I'd like to see the same chart now done as a line chart, I can very easily move the cursor over to the line section, hit one key, and then plot it once again, and it will take the very same data and give me a line chart. In the same way, if I would like to see the chart done in a different way from the line, I could, for instance, select something like a pie chart. and hit a key called color. And what this brings up is a palette of 16 colors. If I don't like the red in that section of the pie and I'd like to swap it with yellow, I can indicate that I'd like to swap two colors. And when I move down to the yellow then, hit the swap key once again and it substitutes yellow in for red. If I'd like to operate on the purple, I can do a number of things to change the color interactively. Here I have three keys called red, green, and blue. And what I can do is to operate on the red portion. And by spinning the thumb wheel, I can take red out of the picture. Or I can add more red all the way over, changes it to a pink. Now, if you're more of an artist and you understand hue, saturation, and lightness, you can look at changing colors in the very same way, just with a different type of device. If you decide to use the hue, 
it works very much running you through the spectrum. If you work on the saturation, well, it makes it more of a pastel look. You can see that it's, that it's changing it a bit. Or the lightness, if you take the lightness out, it will just make it a darker portion of the pie. The terminal has 4,096 colors, so you have a lot of flexibility in color. At Hewlett Packard, we are trying to make business graphics so useful and so easy to use that an individual ought to be able to walk up to a device and generate handsome looking bar charts and pie charts. And for that, you don't have to know how to be a programmer. So the computer really makes nonsense of our conventional ways of categorizing things. Art here, science there, business here. They all seem to merge into one. That's right. Computer graphics in particular cut right across the usual boundaries. Just about anybody can make use of them. Now, what kind of charts and graphs could I produce on a small personal computer? There are graphics packages for businessmen and mathematicians that are designed to help you draw bar charts and pie graphs and all that sort of thing. There's one very simple package for the Atari called Graphit. Ah, bar and pie graphing program main menu, bar charts, pie graphs. Okay, let's try bar charts, B. Enter title, title. Well, let's suppose you want to make a chart of your company's sales each month. So the title could be monthly sales. Enter number of factors. Uh, well, I guess that's my sales for each month, so type one. Column one label. Uh, I could label each column with the name of the month? That's it. Just do the first six months. Okay. January, uh, February, March, April, May, and June. Okay. Well, let's see now. <clears throat> I was selling wedgets. So, the, uh, let's see, in January, I sold five wedgets. And uh, February, I did a little better. I sold seven wedgets. March, I, it wasn't so good. There was four wedgets. And April, we got eight wedgets. And in May, we had nine wedgets we sold. In June, we dropped back to five. And here we go. Hey, that's neat. It shows very clearly the way the wedget business is going. So anyone can make graphs and charts even on a microcomputer. And you can get some really very attractive pictures on these screens. But not all these computers are using regular TV screens, are they? No. Some are ordinary TV sets, but some are monitors. What's the difference between a TV set and a monitor? This whole question of computer screens can get quite confusing because not only do we have to sort out TV sets from monitors, but we also have to deal with the mysterious sets of initials, such as CRT and RF. To clear this up, let's begin by having a look at what goes on behind the computer screen. This is a home television set, and this is a monitor. If you look inside them, in both cases you'll find something called a cathode, which shoots a stream of electrons, sometimes called a cathode ray, at the back of the video screen. The screen is coated with a special chemical called a phosphor. And a tiny spot of this phosphor will glow whenever it is hit by the electron beam. And it is patterns of various parts of the phosphor that either glow or do not glow that make up the picture that you see on the other side of the screen. The cathode and the phosphor coated screen are encased in a vacuum tube and this whole arrangement is called a cathode ray tube, or CRT. So both a TV set and a monitor can also correctly be called a CRT. So much for the similarities between TV sets and monitors. Now for the differences. First difference, the TV set can only cope with information that comes in the form of what are called radio frequency signals, or RF signals. But in order for a computer to put information on a screen, 
it has to send out what are called video signals. So before information can get from a computer to a TV set, it has to be modulated from video to radio frequency. And this is done by an RF modulator. Now for the second difference between a TV set and a monitor. Most TVs are only built to show regular television pictures. They were never intended to display fine detail, in particular, fine print. Although the screen of a TV set may well contain as many pixels as the screen of a monitor, the TV set is simply not designed to turn these pixels on and off as precisely and as rapidly as a monitor is. So if you plug your computer into a TV set and type in some words, the pixels making up the tiny letters will tend to smear and be difficult to read. Whereas if you plug your computer into a monitor with its very precise and rapid control of individual pixels, what you type will be very crisp and clear. That is why, if you have a choice, you should make sure that the CRT into which you plug your computer is a monitor rather than a TV set. But do I have a choice with all these computers? Well, most of them give you the option of using a TV set or monitor. But certain computers are really designed for monitors only. For example, the IBM and the Xerox. And of course, with the PET and the TRS-80 Model 3, the monitor is built in, so you don't need to worry about it. And with the Atari, I see I was using a TV set. And with the Apple, a monitor. Is that why the graphics look so good? That's right. And that's the end of our brief look at computer graphics. In our next episode, we'll learn how to make music on the computer. Until next time, I'm Luba Goy for Bits and Bytes. And I'm Billy Van. Bye.